Congresswoman Chu, we just want to thank you for the great relationship that we've enjoyed over the past several years with, uh, with KPAC in your office, and thanks to your team for being so accommodating and working with us. We look forward to continuing to work with you, National Capacity, and all of the groups in the room to push this agenda. Data is so important, and so thank you for highlighting that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a slight shift in our program. Uh, we have a very esteemed congressman in the House, and to me, he epitomizes the essential activist policymaker. Um, I have, ever since I came to Washington, I have had the incredible pleasure and honor of being a part of networks that have worked extensively and closely with this next individual. Dean John Conyers, congressman from the great city of Detroit. He represents Michigan's 13th congressional district. That represents Detroit and surrounding communities, and he's done so since 1964. He is the most senior member of the House of Representatives, and he's held many leadership roles. Uh, he became the chairman of the House Committee on Government and Operations in 1989. In 2006, he was chosen to lead the House Committee on the Judiciary, where he chaired it from the 110th and 111th of Congresses. And he's also one of 13 founding members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, he's also instrumental for getting the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday passed into law. Uh, he's also been just uh, just an inspiration and a delight. He is the kind of policymaker who works closely with organizations like ours to push an agenda, and he has been relentless on the issue of jobs and opportunity and inclusion. Can you join me in please welcoming Dean, Congressman, Ranking Member John Conyers. Thank you. Top of the morning, everybody. Great to be here. Good to see you all. I'm uh, delighted that uh, Maya Rockamore is uh, still pushing for a deeper understanding of the relationship between uh, uh, a jobs policy uh, and how we connect up uh, full employment for everybody. And, you know, that's my number one domestic goal on my agenda is that we become a full employment uh, nation. We become committed to that, and that becomes domestic issue number one, full employment with jobs or training people for jobs. And, and uh, to me, uh, I would love for a president Obama to, in his legacy, go out uh, with that kind of emphasis, that he wants to create a, a way for everybody to realize that we should be measuring how many people are working, how many people are not working, how many people need training. To me, that would be an ideal uh, a way for him uh, to leave the White House, don't you? I, I hope I hope I can persuade uh, him to to take that move. Now, uh, the Global Policy Solutions, the Insight Center for Community Economic Development, uh, uh, are leading the way to shine the light on our nation's growing racial gap. Uh, it's unacceptable that for every dollar of white medium, median net worth, people of color have less than seven cents. And now that's, that's completely shocking and it was part of my uh, closer examination of this, seven cents versus one dollar. Now, 
that explains the gap right there. I mean, if, if that's if that's the the accurate differential, then of course there's a gap, a big gap, bigger than than I uh, would have thought. And it's not just a matter of uh, bad fortune. The racial gap is the result of public policy rooted formally in discrimination. And now we must use public policy to finally put these economic inequities behind us. Can we do it? I think so. Uh, we're coming, uh, uh, what we're coming out of is a post-slavery uh, economy and we're trying to make up for it. Uh, and and this is this is not merely uh, bad fortune. It's due to the legacy of discrimination, and has caused me to uh, propose HR 40, a commission to study reparation proposals for African Americans. We've got to go into the. background of uh, and the history and it's it's not uh, complex or difficult to see uh, we, we've got to begin a discussion and I'm not talking about uh, a dollars and cents type solution I'm talking about an analysis where we understand the cultural roots of the problem that we're confronted with and that's what I hope uh, our study of reparation proposals and how we move out of this and understand the cultural dimensions uh, of the problem. Uh, attempts to eradicate today's racial discrimination and economic disparities will be successful when we understand the past injustices and inequities. A commission can take us into this dark path and bring us into a brighter future. Uh, and so, as I have in the past, I, I welcome uh, constructive discourse on H.R. 40 and the creation of this commission in the Congress as soon as we can. And we may have to uh, take steps uh, Ms. Rockamore and uh, our organizations, we may have to do it ourselves. We can't wait on Congress to, uh, to, to uh, come to a majority conclusion on something as dramatic and critical as this. Uh, I, don't, I don't see uh, the conservatives that uh, work with me in the Congress uh, coming together on anything else, very important. Uh, so this would just be another uh, one on a, a long list of uh, things that we, we have a difference of view on. But what I want to do is try to create a constructive discourse. You know, it's one thing to debate uh, with somebody, uh, but, but what, usually happens is positions harden. <laughs> Everybody, be, the more you debate, the more uh, convinced you are that your position is the correct one and it's the other or your opponent that's uh, incorrect. And so uh, uh, I'm pleased that closing the racial wealth gap initiative focuses on targeted job creation, full employment, uh, and these are the key policies that can reverse the longstanding uh, racial wealth gap. Of course, Dr. King uh, frequently talked about that if you don't have a job, how can you pursue happiness? <laughs> uh, you've got to be doing something 
to get happiness and its income or jobs. So uh, even before I marched with Dr. King in 1963, I'll never forget, uh, the, the one st statistic that's remained constant uh, is the unemployment rate for blacks is about double that of whites. And uh, in the Congressional Black Caucus, we know this reality uh, firsthand. Uh, in every member's congressional district, the black unemployment rate remains above 11%. This means that African-American unemployment in CBC districts is worse today than unemployment was during the height of the Great Recession of 2008. And in my district, the 13th District of Michigan, unemployment stands at 19.1%. But the African-American rate of unemployment is 25.3%. This is in Detroit right now. In other words, African Americans continue to face crisis levels of unemployment long after other communities have largely recovered. And thankfully, we know ways to solve the problem. The solutions are policies that move us toward a full employment society. If the president would announce that that's what he wants to leave in his legacy is how we address this very critical problem. Now the Economic Policy Institute uh, study shows that between 1995 and 2000 was the closest our nation has been to full employment with the unemployment rate at 4%. The difference between black and white unemployment rates was the smallest that it's ever been. During that period, real median hourly wage growth for African Americans actually exceeded wage growth for whites. The result was a reduction in racial inequality and an expansion of the black middle class. This experience demonstrates the importance of policies that ensure that jobs are available for all who want work. A recent study by the Economic Policy Institute found that a one percentage point reduction in the national unemployment rate leads to a nearly two point decline in the African American unemployment rate. In other words, a one percentage decline in national unemployment rates would provide jobs for around 200,000 African American workers. To accomplish this, I have Again, introduce H.R. 1000, the Humphrey Hawkins 21st Century Full Employment Training Act, which would create millions of jobs and provide training in areas for those struggling uh, against unemployment. Under H.R. 1000, the Department of Labor would work collaboratively with local and state institutions, nonprofits, and educational institutions to fund community-based fast-track jobs that would train and pay unemployed youth and adults to rebuild our nation's crumbling and dilapidated, well, you know, roads, bridges, schools, housing, and even neighborhoods. H.R. 1000 would fund unemployed auto workers and others to get retrained and work 
working to build an energy efficient economy. Plenty of jobs there. It would make investments in the nation's future by training and employing people to work in child care, early childhood development, and preschool teaching. All of this is funded by a small tax on Wall Street speculation. I think it's 0.7 tenths of 1%. That's all we need uh, to get this rolling. Despite causing our economic crisis, the hardest hit firms on Wall Street got a bailout. I, was, I participated in that. But the hardest hit Americans never did. They were, they were left high and dry. And so, my friends, it's past time to give assistance to American families by providing the guarantee of a job or training for everyone that wants employment. Providing this job or training for all who want work will have a profound impact on the racial wealth gap that has plagued our country almost since its founding. Thank you. Thanks so much for what you're doing and for having uh, me and others here and for all the tireless work you've done to bring attention to this uh, too often overlook or misunderstood issue. I thank you for allowing me to be in front of you today. My gratitude. Thanks so much.